Good morning. Happy Easter. Would you stand with us? We're going to worship the Lord and honor our great King Jesus, who died but is alive. Aren't you grateful he's alive?
we celebrate that you hold all power and that there is nothing, there is nothing that can stop you. There is nothing that can stop you, not even death or the grave, not even sin. And so, Lord, we celebrate and rejoice in that this morning as a free people. Yes, Lord. Lord, we love you. And God, we thank you for what this day represents. And God, we thank you for your spirit that is here with us this morning, God. And Lord, that it's not just today that you show up and you meet with us. But God, our hearts come ready to hear from you and to receive from you this morning and to rejoice in your goodness to us, God. Lord, we celebrate today. And we give you all praise and all glory and all honor today because you alone are worthy, Jesus. We love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, welcome to church, everyone. Welcome to church. Thanks for being here with us today. Hey, if you're new around here, you are a guest, and we are extra glad that you're here today. Can we give our guests a warm welcome? Yeah. Also, if it's your first time in a long time, we are extra glad that you are here, that you came back. Let's give them a warm welcome. Amen. Thanks for coming to celebrate the resurrection with us today. We have a special reading uh, that we're going to do together that's a little call and response thing, okay? Typically what I do on Easter is I get up here and I say, he is risen, and everyone claps. And I have to, want, you know, every year remind everyone that what, what you respond to when someone says, he is risen today is, he is risen indeed. Okay, so we've, got, we've actually got this responsive reading prayer that's going to help us uh, to reflect on the meaning of today, but also gives us the prompt to know what to say uh, because we're... We struggle with that. I don't know. All right. Hmm. Out of the darkness of sin, grief, and despair comes a message of hope. Christ is risen. He is risen we run to the tomb to see for ourselves, and it is true. Christ is risen. We hear a voice call our name, and we know our risen Lord is with us now and always. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray together. God of all our days, we come this morning with eager anticipation. We seek to know you, to see you, to touch you. Open our hearts that we might experience you anew. Open our lives that we may be faithful witnesses to your resurrection. May we, with shouts of joy, proclaim your steadfast, liberating love to all people everywhere. Amen.
He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Today is the day we get to celebrate that it is enough. We have enough. That everything that we face here, loss, brokenness, pain, even the things we walked with Jesus through this week, betrayal, and abandonment, friends not being able to hold space with them in the darkest night. It is enough. He has overcome. He has defeated even death. And today we say that we know that because of this great redemption, we will worship together in heaven where all will be made right. We will stand together and lift his name on high. What a glorious day that'll be. And so today, we get to live out that reality. So we're going to spend a couple minutes praying. We're going to praise God that he is risen. He's risen indeed. I was just like, it was a little, yeah, yeah. So seeing if you're watching, you know. Yeah. So today, we're going to praise God because he is risen. Amen. And we're going to pray, God, would you grow the reality of that in us? Understanding, Would you wake that up in us, that reality? And would you help us live resurrection lives, a life that lives into that reality, that he is enough, that we have enough in him. And Lord, would you help us to welcome others into the kingdom and live our lives in such a way that they can't help but wonder, what do they have? So the way that works here at Greenhouse is you just scooch up to your neighbor and get over any awkwardness and you... Uh, and you were just going to pray for a few minutes and thank God for those things and pray for those things. And then I close us out in prayer. Um, so I'll give you a couple minutes and then I'll close us out. Just look at your neighbor if you don't know what to do. What a gift to get to celebrate with your church all over the world that you are risen. You are risen indeed. So we lift your name on high. And we thank you, Lord. Would you wake up the wonder of it in us, in our hearts, in our minds, in our bodies, Lord. Today, let us walk around reminding ourselves all day of the great reality of our redemption through you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Amen. We'd love to pray with you as a prayer team. I send out emails every week, and uh, we
We have a team after church back here to pray with you. You can text the word Greenhouse to 94000, and you can fill out our form on there, which includes prayer requests. And, uh, and we'd love to stand with you and celebrate with you and bless you. And I just encourage you, like the slide says, don't, don't walk alone. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to take just a minute here. Uh, kids are going to head upstairs to have all the fun with Miss Jenny, Mr. Talon. The rest of the team is waiting up there for them. They're going to have a great time. Everyone else, this is an opportunity to say hi to folks around you. If you see someone on the other side of the room you want to say hey to, you can run across there. So take a couple minutes, and then we'll keep on moving. All right. Hey, welcome to church, everybody. Thanks for being here today. I know. I know. It, the music stopped. It got weird. I don't know. Everyone's looking at me. Hey, you guys can talk through the first 30 seconds of announcements. I'll allow it. 20. Now it's down to 20, though. Your time's ticking fast. Hey, welcome to church. Thanks for being here today. You guys look just dapper today. I mean, looking good, guys. Which, uh, if you haven't been upstairs yet, it's a good thing you came dressed up because the photo booth up there. All right. If, in case you didn't know, there's a photo booth today upstairs after after yeah. church, so you can go up there and get your Easter pictures taken. It looks awesome, and you want to do that. Hey, thanks for being here today. If you're new around here, uh, we'd love to have you fill out one of our response cards. We've got those there in the seat back in front of you. Uh, you can fill that out. Give us a little bit of information about yourself. The back side of that guy has a glossary on it, so there's some things, there's some check boxes and such on there that you might consider, and they might be confusing because there's words like, I want to get to connect, and you may not know what Connect is. And what so on the back connect? of that card, it will explain to you what, what those things are. You can check any appropriate boxes and then drop those in one of those two drop boxes on your way out of here today. Love it. And then we've got Sunday school coming in April, guys. Oh. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if you've been into any Sunday schools yet, but they have been amazing. Yep, they have. And so this next one's going to be on fasting. Um, we're going through John Mark Comer's um, curriculum on fasting. And so you guys are really going to want to be there for that. I know that this is a spiritual discipline that has really grown us um, quite a bit in the last couple years. Um, but it's also over the church, um, kind of one of the most neglected yeah. uh, spiritual disciplines. And so we really highly encourage you guys to get into that and you'll see some major growth through that. So come join us Sunday mornings in April. Yep. Starts next week, 830 to 930. And then uh, we have child care available upon request for that. And then we've got men's night and women's night coming up in Woo April too, all right? So those are happening on Tuesday nights. Men, it's Tuesday, April 9th. Ladies, it's tu Tuesday, April 23rd. Uh, these are opportunities to get together, to eat dinner here together. Men, we're having wings, yeah. all right? Ladies, it's Italian, okay? Um, I, I know, I, I don't know where to go from here actually right now. In this <laughs> wings are... You know, I mean, ladies, if there's like a revolt and you're like, we want wings, we can make it happen. I mean, see, OK. All right. I don't know. Anyways, it's fifteen dollars a person. We will have child care available for that as well. Five bucks a kid, ten bucks per family. Uh, we eat dinner together. We sing together. We learn together. We connect. We sit at round tables. It's a blast. Uh, you want to be here for 
for those. And so sign up on Realm, RSVP on there, and then let us know if you have any questions. That's all we've got. We'll turn it over to Pastor Jared. Hey, you guys look good. Give each other a hand. You guys look really, really sharp today. Really, really sharp. Hey, before we get started, I am uh, I'm just so grateful to be able to preach at Easter. At Easter. Amen. Um, you might have, you might be on um, the Lawrence scanner on Facebook. Anybody on the scanner? Those are my children in in matching bunny suits on miniature motorcycles, and they have broken the internet. So I have now graduated from skate night guy to. Um, Motorcycle bunny dad. That's my claim to fame. That's what I'm doing now. <laughs> so like it and share it, seriously. Uh, we're trying to monetize this. Um, <laughs> which is a weird segue into what I'm about to say. <laughs> As we pay attention to worshiping God, a part of that is to worship him with our money. And, uh, and so I just want to remind you that in the kingdom, when we... Uh, when we live generously and we give through the church, here's what I can assure you. Your money will have a return. Your money will have a return. Now, for those of us who are still noticing the fact that basically all restaurants cost the same amount of money now. Have you noticed notice this? You go, you, you go to McDonald's, 20 bucks a person. Right, you you go to you go to Outback, twenty bucks a per. I don't even know if there's an Outback anymore. Whatever. Uh, sometimes I get up from a meal and I've dropped, you know, with our family a hundred bucks, and I go, "Wow, we could have made that at home for much cheaper and much better." And so, what I want to say is, in a world where our money feels like it's just driveling away, uh, I want to be a person who thinks critically about where my money's going, and I want it to have the greatest return. And what I want to tell you is sowing into what God is about creates a return in the hearts of the people in our city. And so I want you to redeem your money uh, simply by being a person who invested in all that God is doing to see people meet Jesus and find community. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. We're going to get into it. Father, thank you uh, for bringing us here on Easter uh, with this flower that I get to dodge while preaching. And uh, thank you for my friends. Thank you for my new friends. Uh, we want to hear from you today, God. Uh, we're not just here to do a religious duty. Uh, we are here to meet with an awesome God. And so would you help us to do that through anything that's distracting? Help us to do that. And as we open the word today, God, uh, may just the beauty and the value of the kingdom of God be so crystal clear to us this morning uh, so that you would meet us in our deepest places today, and uh, we celebrate that. Lord, my words are fleeting, they're forgettable, and uh, often uh, they, they fail to produce life. But I know that your word and your words produce life every single time. And so we lean in to listen to what you might say to us. I'm going to preach a little sermon, and, and, and I'm going to preach one, you know, one sermon, uh, but I'm praying that dozens of sermons would happen as the Holy Spirit uses these words uh, in our lives. So would you meet us personally in that way? Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, may they be pleasing in your sight, God. You are my rock. You are my redeemer. You are my very best friend. And all my friends say, amen, amen. amen. Okay, let's do a little time travel. A little time travel. We're going to travel back. Can I grab that water from you? We're going to travel back um, a little over four years. To January 1st, 2020. I thought this was an Easter service. I thought it was like, Hosanna and everything's good. You're going to, okay. January 1st, 2020. Now imagine we're just sitting there chatting. And I say something like this. Hey, um, I think that just in a few, in a few months... Uh, there will be a rush on toilet paper, and, and you will value toilet paper almost as much as money. Can, can you imagine me telling you that? You'd be like, no way. 
What if I told you this? Hey, guys, something, uh, something is going to happen where, uh, where your children are going to get out for spring break, and they're, they're not going to go back for like a year and a half. You'd be like, that sounds terrible. And guess what? You were right. You love them, but that's a long day. I get no amens this morning. Nobody's like, preach it. Yeah, you guys are so far removed, you're trying to act like they didn't drive you crazy at home. But that's okay. They're upstairs. They don't know. Uh, what, what if I told you something like this? Um, you're going to become a connoisseur of your very favorite hand sanitizer. There's going to be some that you just, that's for the birds. That's not me. We will categorize each other by the type of sani that we like. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine trying to wrap your head around all that that would mean. Now. I'm not trying to take us to a dark place this morning. I'm going to take us to a bright and lovely place. Uh, But I do want to say that a global pandemic gives us a picture of what it might look like if there is, listen to me, widespread fear of death. What does a widespread fear of death do to the human soul? What does a widespread fear of death do to a local middle school? What does a widespread fear of death do to a family that has social media? What does widespread fear of death uh, do? Well, I'll tell you what it does. It gives one of the largest spikes to gun sales. That's what widespread fear of death does. A widespread fear of death um, causes us to fear every every move economically. It it starts to erode our very um, ideas of what is actually solid. We, We go, man, I used to count on this being solid. Maybe it's my job. Maybe it's my relationships. Maybe it's my nation. And we start to ask ourselves, man, is anything solid anymore? Widespread fear of death uh, tends to do this stuff. Um, It heightens a a sort of distrust of the government, which for some of you guys was not a jump at all. But I think more detrimental than a widespread fear of government was our widespread fear of our neighbor. Our widespread fear of people who didn't believe like us. I want you to just think about widespread fear of death, what it does to the human soul. Now, my friend Talon and I, we got on one of those bungee cord things that shoot you 290 million feet in the air. Do you guys have a picture of this? That's us way up there. Those are some sort of girders. I don't know. That's before we even take off. I'm screaming just like that. There were people like, oh, is there a sixth grade girl getting on? It's like, nope, 44-year-old man. Fear of death. Now, now I don't know if I was actually afraid of death because there were harnesses and all these things. But then when you realize that it was set up like four days ago by, by a carnival hand, What does it look like to live with the fear of death? Now, there, there is, there is a, um, a phobia, uh, thanatophobia, I think is how you say that. And it is sort of this fear of death. Listen to this. And, and the way that you know that something is disordered is that someone would work with you to assess this. Yes, you're afraid of it, but is it impeding on a normal, healthy life? That's the, that's, that's the grid of good counselors. Okay, I'm hearing you, all right? To what degree is it impeding on your ability to live a good and healthy life? And so there is actually that. Now, um, I want to start to explore with you today um, what, what the flip side looks like. What does it look like to live without a fear of death? So we're going to start thinking this way. What does it look like to live without a fear of death? Now, I'm not talking about these crazy people who climb buildings, like something's just off. Did you see the guy, did you see the guy climbing the sphere in, in Las Vegas? Yeah, yeah, he just climbs skyscrapers. Show him, show him the picture. Uh, so, so maybe you've seen Free Solo. No safety equipment. Have you seen Free Solo? 
Okay, put it in your Netflix. Go watch Free Solo. And then this guy, he literally, he just climbs buildings. And he gets to the top. There's something broken in his brain. Wouldn't you agree? So I'm not talking about them. I'm not talking about them because, uh, you know, if someone's chasing me, yelling weird things, I'm running. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating for, for that sort of a weird deal. But what does it look like when humans can live in a environment where they are not afraid of death? And actually, the scriptures open up. Scriptures open up with a story of what it looks like for humanity to live without the fear of death. As we open the scriptures, we, we see this amazing sort of this great poem, this epic language talking about uh, creation. And God is speaking and things are coming into existence. And it's amazing. And there's sort of this beautiful culmination with humanity, with Adam and and. And, uh, and Eve and this whole thing. And so let's think about sort of the picture in the Garden of Eden in the beginning. What did it look like? What did it look like when humanity did not have death hovering over it? What did it look like? Well, it, it breeds creativity. Creation. Dreaming together beauty, naming things. It's just a, a world of wonder, just the human soul coming and saying, I'm here to contribute to life. I'm not here to hide from it. I'm here to interact with nature. I'm, I'm here to, to, to walk in the cool of the day with God. That's what the human spirit, it seems like, uh, is doing at this time. There's order. Things become ordered. Things have harmony. There is companionship bef- between people. There's wonder. There's trust. There's men who are unguarded. There are women uh, who are unashamed. Who would like to live in that world? They weren't sinning against one another. There was no reason to wonder if the trust was there. Beautiful, beautiful. And then we know that you don't have to get too far in the pages to learn that there is, a, there is a dragon of death. Now, you can, you can study this out a bit more. But the, 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 uh, the picture here, um, pulling from all sorts of places, but the picture that's weaved within the scriptures is the idea of a, of a death dragon that somehow culminates in or lives in or, or sort of exists in the depths of the sea. And, and this dragon then, in some way, slithers into the Garden of Eden and brings with him brokenness, brings with him distrust of one another, brings with him death. And what we find is, in those epic poems, we find that the fear of death enters the human story with this original sin. What changed? What changed in the garden? What changed with eating of forbidden fruit? Well, one of the most profound things that changed is men and women started to live with the fear of death for the first time. Wow. What a change. And the story goes on. And we see even our heroes of the faith. We see even our heroes of the faith, the, the moments where we, where we zoom in to see what's going on with them, we see them living under the curse of the fear of death. Think about Abraham. God says, you're going to have children. They're going to be as numerous as the stars. And he starts to get old. And watch this. He fears the death of family and life and God coming through on a promise. And he finds another lady to bear him a child outside of the will of God. Fearing. Well, what if God, what if God doesn't deliver? What's that going to mean? What if I don't have any children? How am I going to get there? And he took his life in his own hands because he was afraid of the death of a dream. He was afraid of the death of, of a family uh, dying off. Think about, think about David. 
A man after God's own heart? Anyone read stories about David lately? I, in my personal reading, I've been I've been walking through, um, uh, been walking through all the stories of David, and man, there I just I, there have been times where I've prayed and I've said, "Lord, was David a creep?" I'm not going to tell you what I thought he answered me, but I do know this: that David feared death himself, and he feared death of his reputation. And not only did he commit crimes against Bathsheba, but he also covered his crimes with more crimes by killing her husband. You see, David, we could see, was afraid of reputational death. David was afraid of his kingdom dying. And it created more brokenness in the world. More more agitation, less of God's good kingdom. And then we fast forward to a man named Jesus. Somebody shout. Hey, hey, hey. Then we fast forward to a man named Jesus. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Who's the new Adam? The new Adam shows up and he goes, Yo! Everybody listen up. You about to see what happens when a human soul roams the wicked world without the fear of death. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah. And Jesus showed up in a big way, wouldn't you say? It's, it's profound to think that in the mind of Jews, that death itself and the fear of death is a serpent under the water. And then Jesus just says, what now? Hello? Jesus says, what now? I'm not afraid of sinking, and I'm not afraid of death that is underneath me. And he speaks prophetically by walking on the water. Woohoo! Let's close it down right now. Some of y'all know I got more notes than that. You can't keep me out of the pulpit too long without me bringing seven pages of notes. Jesus shows up and he begins to show us what it's like. To live in the human story, even post-fall, as a man who was not afraid of death. So what sorts of things did Jesus do? Well, when he was with his friends and they were in a boat and they were being tossed to and fro and there was a horrible storm on a lake, what was Jesus doing? He was biting his nails, saying, oh, I hope we make it. Was he doing that? Was he cursing God for leaving him alone? Was he rallying people up? Was he bailing water? No, 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 no. Jesus was doing none of that. He was sleeping in a boat in a storm. Because Jesus shows us what it's like when humanity is able to live without the fear of death. Jesus also walked right up to people who could kill him, and he told them the truth. He said, I am the Son of God. And he walked right up to religious leaders who could kill his his social standing. He walked right up to religious leaders who could cancel him in some way. He walked right up to political leaders who could have him killed. And Jesus of Nazareth walked right up to him without the fear of death, and he told them clearly who he was. Wow. Wow. Wow, you would be terrified to walk around Jesus because if you weren't careful, you might think that the Son of God had a screw loose because he walked in such an authority, and his authority was, I will not cower to death. Wow, what a God. He befriended outcast. He befriended outcast who surely stored up sort of violent tendencies in other people. And a man who's not afraid of death, watch this, befriends people like Judas. Now, I'm so afraid of death, I'm not trying to befriend Judas for nothing. I need no evil people on a regular basis in my life. I got enough problems. Anybody else? But Jesus, unafraid unafraid of death, befriends Judas, 
only to find that Judas fears his own physical death, or to find that Jesus, or sorry, that Judas fears his own death of political rule through Jesus. He gets so frightened by the death of dreams and death of being on the inside of the circle and, and his own death that he sells Jesus out for a few coins. Wow. And then Jesus being arrested, standing with Peter. Peter, who's fearing death himself, fearing death of dying, he cuts somebody's ear off. He gets the intern and cuts their ear off, and Jesus heals them. And then Jesus says in Matthew 26, he goes, hey, Peter, put your sword back. Put your sword back in its place. For whoever lives by that sword is actually going to die by that sword. I imagine Jesus standing up tall. I imagine they've got their hands on Jesus. They're beginning to arrest him. They're threatening Jesus, and Jesus stands up under the fear of what he's about, uh, under, under this threat of what is about to happen. And he speaks to Peter, and he says, don't draw the sword, because you'll die by it if you do. Do not think that I can't call on my father. And he will at once send 80,000 angels to comfort me. But how then could the scriptures be fulfilled that say that it must happen this way? Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Jesus says, hey, it's going to be tough. He says, if there's any way that wrath could pass from me, please, Father, that would be amazing. But he said, I'm going to have to walk through. And I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. It's going to be painful. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be agonizing. They're going to talk about it for the rest of all of eternity. They're going to talk about what they're about to do to me. But I must go through. At his trial, he was not afraid of death to the point to where he was not willing to speak prophetically or just to close his mouth and say nothing. And then a crowd, listen to me, a crowd under the curse of the fear of death, feared for their own lives, feared for the death of their religious system, feared for the death of their social standing. And because of a crowd's fear of death, they asked for Barabbas, a murderer, to be released in their midst. Because Jesus threatened to kill what they loved. Are you starting to see? That it's really not hyperbole. It's really not overstating it. We live in a culture and a world that is constantly tempting us to fear death. Fear death. Fear death. Fear death. Peter then, you know the story. Jesus is arrested. Peter fears death and social uh, death. To the point to where he sells Jesus out three times. And so I guess what I want to say to you very, very um, clearly is this. Jesus is our great hero. Is this thing on? Hey, church. Jesus is our great hero. He is the new Adam. Who shows us how to live without the fear of death. Wow. Jesus is our great hero. He showed us that he could live free from the fear of death. Jesus was not trapped by his own sin. He was not trying to keep his own secrets. Jesus never showed up insecure. Jesus was not trapped by doubt. Jesus was not trapped, listen to me, Jesus was not trapped by hating his enemies. Jesus was not trapped by intimidation. No. Jesus lived as a human soul that was not afraid of death. Now, we could close it down, and we could go, awesome, glad I showed up for Easter. Jesus is the hero. But here's what I have to tell you. The story gets even better. Who wants to know how it's even better than that? Anybody here? 
Do you want to hear how it's even better than that? Well, you got to encourage me or I'm just going to stop. Thank you. That's my mother-in-law. Appreciate you, Debbie. Appreciate you. I preach to an audience of one. <laughs> Debbie. <laughs> she gave me the greatest gift I've ever. <laughs> Remember that one, babe. <clears throat> hey, 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 hey. Jesus was killed. And he walked head first into death. And then they placed his body in a tomb. And we could just sit back and just go, wow, what a God. But something happened. This is where it gets good. Hello? Something happened. It wasn't just like, yay, God. Yay, Jesus. No, something good happened. And his body rested on the Sabbath. But then Sunday morning came. Sunday morning came. And his body began to breathe air again. And life came back into that body that was once killed and bloodied. And the greatest miracle, even the greatest physical miracle, was that his veins and his, and his uh, muscles and his ligaments and everything, over the course of just a few hours, somehow were healed to where he could actually get up, take off his garments, and walk out of the tomb. That's what we celebrate today. That Jesus, not only was he not scared of death, but watch this. He beat death. He beat death. He wasn't just, I wasn't scared of that bully, then they punched me in the mouth. No, he said, I walked through the bully to redeem the bully. The story gets better. Jesus, his body quakes. And he resurrects and he comes out of that tomb. And what we know is that when he comes out of that tomb, somehow, some way, and I don't understand it, his blood and his sacrifice and his ability to be raised back to life paid off some sort of a debt that separated God from his children. And somehow, some way, what Jesus did on the cross and the blood that he shed and the fact that he went into a tomb and the fact that he resurrected, somehow, some way, he punched the bully. Of, 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 of Satan and demon and death right in the mouth. And he became victorious somehow through this thing. I don't understand it. But he was victorious. And in some way, because of those days, because of that death, burial, and resurrection, he took something, he took a wound in the human soul. He took a wound in all of humanity. And he healed it. He healed the wound that no one else can heal. He is the great physician. Yes, he grabbed some people around the pool and got them to walk, but that is nothing like he did to heal the wound that separated us from our loving father. He reconciled us to his father. That's what Jesus did. Jesus rose and he did these things and he reconciled disobedient children to their father. And he visited all sorts of people over the next 40 days. And we see this... This incredible walk through death, not only did, was he not afraid of it, but he walked through it. Now watch this. Something profound happened. And was made available for every human soul. And I want to read it to you. Listen to this. Hebrews 2. <laughs> if you guys do not shout at the fifth line. Lord, please. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared their humanity. So that by his death. <laughs> That by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Are you catching this, church? Are you catching it? Not only did he walk without the fear of death. 
But he went into the grave and he rose again to free you, to free me, to free us, to free all of humanity from the overwhelming fear of death. And somebody better shout in here. Woohoo! Wow. There was no way, but now there's a way. We were cooked, y'all. And then Jesus showed up and said, no, 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 live through me, and you don't have to be afraid of death anymore. Whoa. Whoa. I hope this is news to at least one person in this room. That through obedience to Jesus, through salvation of Jesus, through confession of sin, through an open and honest and, 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 and uh, uh, surrendering heart towards Jesus, One of the gifts that Jesus will give you is that you will walk upright without the fear of death. And that that nasty serpent who slithers around you and wants to intimidate you, that nasty serpent who says, say something, I dare you, that you can walk up to him and you can say, in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who came, the one who walked through your worst trick, In the name of Jesus, I will do the right thing no matter what it costs because I'm not scared of you anymore. I'm not scared of you anymore. I'm not scared of what you might do anymore. I'm not scared of honesty anymore. I'm not scared of vulnerability anymore. In the name of Jesus, I am not scared of death anymore. Woo-hoo-hoo! That's the Easter message today. That's the Easter message today. Jesus' resurrection makes a way for us to no longer fear death. As we trust in, as we commit to him, as we rely upon him, the cross gives us a resurrection hope. Who here has the hope that after all this is gone and we roll you in a casket or for you weirdos? I don't know. (laughs) That was a filter. I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of myself. I was raised in a funeral home. My dad had strong feelings about what you do in funerals. He doesn't approve of a lot of your actions, but I'm filtering. Listen to what Jesus says. Let me run through these texts real quick, and then I'm going to put it on the bottom shelf. And then we're going to walk out of here, people with spines who are reminded of who we are in Christ. That's my plan. Watch this. John 6. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son... And believes in him shall have eternal life and will raise them up at the last day. Who's got hope of a resurrection because of Jesus? Matthew 10, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. When you've died to your life, you can truly live. When you have died to being the one who secures all of your security, you can truly live in Christ. Galatians 2, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, Scripture encourages us to carry our cross daily. It is the awareness that I'm finna die, but I embrace it. I embrace it. I'm going to die, and in a lot of ways, all my passions are dead already, and all my hopes are dead already, and all my best laid plans are dead already because I am in Christ. He provides my passions. He provides a way out. He provides my comfort. He provides my security. That's what that means. Matthew 20, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but instead to serve, he gave his life as a ransom. John 15, greater love has no one than this then lay down their life for their friends. John 10, 10, I've come that you might have what? Life and have it to the full. See, when you walk without without an unrighteous fear of death, you have a full life. I'm talking like chilling in um, in the back room at a wedding going like, I heard they need more wine. I'm talking that kind of full life. I'm talking like you're preaching to thousands of people, and you go, who's got a Lunchable? The people are hungry. 
You want to roll? That sort of full life. And when you're not afraid of death, and your heart is so set on a pilgrimage that Christ is all that you have, you can live a full life that walks up to your enemy. And you look in their eyes and you see the very image of God and a passion for the things of God continue to grow year after year and a sacrificial love for the people around you grows every other year and it's at the expense of the fear of death. Is there anybody here who wants to live in that? Is there anybody here who's tasted and seen, but you've been reminded, and it's time to level up? It's time to look the bully in the face and go, I ain't scared of you anymore. It's Christ or nothing. It's Christ or nothing. I will not cower. So what's it look like when you're not gripped by the fear of death? Number one, when your self-worth can't be killed, you don't need to compete or envy anymore. When you're not afraid of physical death, then you tend not to retreat and withdraw and be gripped by paranoia paranoia like you used to. When you're no longer afraid of financial death, you quit cheating and you quit stealing and you start being generous. When you're no longer afraid of status death, then you go to rehab and you humble yourself and you admit when you're wrong. When you're no longer afraid of death, everything changes. When you're no longer afraid of death, when you're no longer afraid of relationship death, you get vulnerable. When you're no longer afraid of stand, of your standard of living dying, you are generous. When you're no longer afraid of repu- reputational death, you openly share your faith. And so how about you? How about you? As it turns out, you are a child of God and a child of Abraham. And in some ways, you're a child of Adam. But if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, listen to me. I have greater hope. You're a child. You're, you're, you're the beloved of the new Adam, the better Adam, the greater Adam, the full Adam. And so if that's you today, then maybe it might make sense to just pause and to simply just ask the Spirit this Easter morning, Where is my fear of death showing up? Where are those places where I'm afraid of death so much that I haven't seen the resurrection life of Jesus? Have you died to your passions? When we were coming to plant the church, I had this old preacher dude looked at me with pity and he said I'm so sorry for what you're about to go through and he said this he said you will never live into the dream of God until he kills yours and can I tell you that I've seen along the way God kill some of my dreams I fully expect that God's going, got many more things that I'm dreaming that he's going to kill. But what I can tell you th- about it is I've made it through. And I've learned that his dreams are better than mine. And I'm just wondering this morning if there's anybody who's ready to take that risk, maybe for the first time. I'm wondering if today there's someone in the room who goes, man, it's a lot of work providing my own life and I'm wondering today if there's somebody here who says it's, it's time to kill my passions and adopt Christ's passions it's time to die to my plans and live in his plans it's time to die to my rights I have the right to be right I have the right to be heard I have the right to be understood I have the right to be forgiven I have the right to be respected When we're no longer afraid of death, we say, God, 
I definitely am not trying to be a doormat, but I do know that this following you thing is going to take at a great cost. And so I died to my overwhelming fear. My overwhelming fear of reputational death. I, I died to my, to my overwhelming fear of financial death. And I want to live in Christ, whatever that means. Have you lost your life in a sense so that you're no longer afraid of losing your life? There's a new life. <laughs> Here's Easter for you. There's new life on the other side of death. Weary soul this morning, there's new life on the other side of death. God's asking you to do something brave. There's new life on the other side of death. God's asking you to make moves and trust him where you haven't trusted him. There's new life on the other side of death. That's what Easter tells us. Wow, what a God. Maybe there's someone here today who is ready to cross a line of faith. You've been placing your faith in yourself. You've been providing your own life. And today, maybe it's been crystal clear what we're talking about today. And you're ready to start following Jesus. It starts with a very simple prayer of submission. Where you just say, huh? Lord, I don't even know what it means, but I just give up. I just give up. I surrender. I'm done fighting you. Now, God, would you save me from all the stuff that's got me? Would you change me? In all the ways that you want to change me. And God, would you help me join your mission? Maybe someone here wants to whisper just quietly. Jesus, save me. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the burial. And thank you for the resurrection. I want to live in this new life. Maybe that's you today. I'd love to hear about it if that is you. We'd love to celebrate that reality in baptism. And here's another Easter hope. Who wants another Easter hope? Y'all full yet? I'm stuffed. Hey, I asked you guys a question. I said, is there anybody who's just stuffed after feasting on the goodness of God? Anybody else? Well, good. I'm the, I'm the last dessert. You ready for the last dessert? If you're a follower of Jesus, listen to me. You will live in a better Eden one day. Christ will come in the clouds. He will separate sheep and goats. This world will pass away, and he will take us to live with him forever in a reality where we are not afraid of death, but instead we are in perpetual life after life after life after life after life. That is the hope of the resurrection. Amen? It's going to be quite a resurrection. Can't wait to see y'all on resurrection morning. I'm going to be at least six, seven. I put in a request. That's my redeemed body. Collins, your guys' day is coming. I'm going to look down on you once more. <laughs> stop, Jared, stop. Will you pray with me? Jesus, the fact that you make a way for us to live without the fear of death in no way diminishes our awe. You are the Easter hero. We thank you that you're such a loving God that you didn't even take that flex and keep it to yourself. But instead, as your word says, you made a way. Would you fill us with a great courage today? Lord, would you continue to clarify all the awesome ways where being in you causes us to stand up and to never fear death in the same way again. We thank you, God, that our souls are secure in you. Our bodies will come and go. People will come and go. Trials will come and go. Jobs will come and go. Reputations will come and go. 
but our souls are secure. And we thank you for it. Jesus, huh, we have a hope of resurrection. May we live in that. Lord, would you bless your people as they go? Or would you make them a great blessing to all those around them? Lord, may you make your face shine upon them. Lord, would you be gracious to them? And Lord, may there be a great wave in our city and in our families and in, in the universe of the soul. A wave of courage to live as those who carry their cross daily. We love you and we're learning to love you more. Lord, help my friends read their paper Bibles every day. And remember that we're here more than just Easter. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. Stand up. High five somebody. Thanks for coming to church.